we are live now so hello everyone welcome to our 2021 fall webinars uh, this is the third episode of the webinars we have we started uh, since uh, the last year today we have as the keynote speaker dr carl landauer um uh, dr carl landauer uh, is a california based lawyer he holds uh, his ll uh, his jd the first law degree from the harvard law school uh, and his phd from uh, yale uh, law school today dr landauer is uh, here to speak about the two genealogy of uh, the genealogy, <coughs> genealogy of international law we will focus Hi. on tl1 tl1 and tl2 movement uh, dr karl is no um, uh, needs no introduction to the world of international law he has been a regular writer uh, uh, and a publicist of the topic he has particularly focused on asian and african uh, on the biographies of asian and african scholars we have been very fortunate to have his papers uh, published on um, uh, biographical papers published on uh, judge nagendra singh among other papers he has written uh, so uh, help me welcome dr karl landauer for the keynote address Uh, over to you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you, and everyone can hear me, right? Yes. Good. Good. So I'd like to start with the title for day, today's talk: Two Genealogies and the Decentering of International Law. As you'll see soon, I will really be talking about three genealogies, speaking about efforts to identify, as many twelve scholars have done, twelve one and twelve two generationally, although in sometimes in terms of a radical critique. but also post colonialism that's the third genealogy in which twail is in scots by genealogy i mean genealogy basically from foucault but very broadly because we can put aside some of those attempts to define his uh, genealogy very sharply uh, separating his archaeology from his genealogy and even uh, uh, philosophers who go down and talk about very specific analysis of um uh, of what is genealogy and how is it based in kantian critique so i want to put that aside and think more broadly so that the historical efforts of the so called 121 lawyers can also be seen um uh within this context as another genealogy because they might be seen as focusing on uh, occlusions and forgetting and so we can bring 121 closer to um their you know their notion of correct correctives so um for example alexandrovich has a reference to the seeds of its own crisis when he talks about bentham's international law which might be seen as a critical genealogical move about the malign uses of for example treaties of protection regarding current Quail writers. I'd like to focus on the importance of post-colonial studies to their work, and emphasize the impact of discourse analysis. So I'd like to look at all of these writers also in their own context. So Twell One and Twell Two. Regarding the notion of Twell One and Twell Two, Anthony Angi and B. S. Chimney raised it in their joint article, Third World Approaches to International Law. Luis Eslava and Sunja Pahuja reference Angie and Chimney in an article in Beyond Post in uh, parentheses colonial the post colonial Chimney elsewhere talks of the failure of the first generation of third world scholars to capture the intimate relationship between colonialism and international law and Prabhakar you've picked up on 121 and 122 as well if James Tuo Gatti refers instead to weak and strong traditions he still essentially is talking generationally especially when he identifies it with the 1960s and 1970s the slava and puhaja may set out to schematize modes of engagement in terms of conservatism reform and revolution actually put a chart in their article but they're also talking about they also talked about 121 and 122 I'd like to return uh to that but first I'd like to focus on the engagement of current 12 scholars or co current 12 colleagues with postcolonial studies. 
It's especially in the historical effort to uncover the structural or DNA of international law on past colonialism, imperialism, slavery, as well as gender, basically the violent birth of international law. Anti, uh, Tony Angie's pivotal imperialism, sovereignty, and the making of international law and its conclusion, and this is sort of throughout the book, writes, this book argues that colonialism was central to the constitution of international law and sovereignty doctrine, end quote. In so Sovereigns, Quasi-Sovereigns, and Africans, Siba uh, Grovini uh, tells, us in, tells us his book, quote, explores two important factors that undermine the universality of international law, the dependence of its norms on Western culture and the dependence of the rules and processes of the law, as well as the structure of the discourse of international politics on various phases of Western imperialism, end quote. Twill scholars find colonial and the colonial and imperial embedded in the very fabric and frame, uh, framework of international law, including efforts purportedly to lift fortunes of third world populations, the law of development, the law of human rights, et cetera. Bala, Bala Krishnan Rajagopal in International Law from Below takes on both. In decolonizing international law, Puha Jha provides important, an important critique of the core of development law. Although existing, there was an existing critique of Bretton Woods institutions. I mean, everybody was not very happy about it. Puha Jha argues that the quote, promised universality of law, uh, the law of development works against third world populations for the very reason that attempts at universality were subsumed from a pervasive rationality that successfully made a claim for a universality of a particular or provincial set of values originating in and congenial to the North, end quote. And one can think of also uh, numerous co contributions, one after another. I mean, uh, James Gotti pours out a million uh, publications on development law and the World Bank and studies of good governments. And there's a whole range of people working on good governance. Human rights law has also had its critique. And this, of course, you know, is, as uh, Raja Gopal mentions, quite ironic because he says, the idea that human rights can be hegemonic can strike its core believers as nothing less than sacrilege. So of course, Twill has been engaged in this fight and you know, raising temperatures. One might in fact read much Twill scholarship as seeing development and human rights law as one more episode of the mission civilatrice. Twill and post-colonial studies. In their genealogical critique, our Twill's co colleagues and many among us here have drawn significantly from post-colonial scholarship, citing over and over the key figures of post-colonial studies, including the members of the Subaltern Studies Collective in India, Franz Fanon, Edward Said, Homi Baba, Gayatri uh, Spivak, and their theoretical guides, including Gramsci, Levinas, Foucault, and Derrida. Angie's imperialism, sovereignty, and international law is clearly a genealogical analysis drawn from post-colonial sources. He turns to Foucault as one example in his discussion of the mandate system, and you can see uh, Foucault in other places. Raja Gopal in his book has at the beginning four sections in a row in which he draws from four thinkers, Foucault for his discussion of governmentality, Fanon for his psychological analysis of colonialism and the tre treatment of nationalism, Gramsci on a, range, uh, on a range of things, including the definition of hegemony and strategies of a counter hegemonic uh, action, and Parta Chatterjee about the nature of post the post-colonial state and the ideology of development. I'd like to follow this through the entire range of 12 scholarship starting with the very title of, for Diane Otto for a special issue of a journal in which she has uh, her article is Post-Colonialism and Law. She references Gramsci on the subaltern and Foucault's subjugated knowledge 
And Gatti's recent uh, Grotius lecture at the American Society of International Law in 2020, you can see it online, tells us you can see it both in text, but also you can see his, his talk itself is online, uh, a YouTube uh, version. He tells us third, the third world is understood, he, understood here, speaks from a subaltern perspective. So he's getting subaltern from Gramsci. Uh, Chimney talks about the human rights discourse being manipulated to further legitimate neoliberal goals. And he turns to Foucault in his third world approaches to international law, a manifesto. And Prabhakar uh, in Indian international law talks about Indian 12.2 builds on subaltern and anti-modernist pathologies of Partha uh, Chatterjee and Arshis Nandi, okay? Uh, and one can go on and on enumerating examples, but I'd like here to make a few observations about post-colonial studies. First, it's important to recognize the vast number of intramural fights among post-colonial scholars. There are long discussions of even the name post-colonial scholarship. You know, whether or not there's, you sh there should be, what happens, the difference between post-colonialism with a hyphen, is that really about the actual historical uh, event as opposed to post-colonial without the hyphen? And Anne McClintock has a chapter about, quote, the pitfalls of the term post-colonialism. For example, she talks about the relationship with other posts, post-structuralism, post-modernism, et cetera. Uh, I think the, there's a beginning of uh, one of the uh, subaltern studies books uh, where there's a discussion of, well, we really don't want to talk about post-modernism at all, but maybe post-structuralism. For example, oh no, actually that's, that's, a, that's a book from the group in, in Leeds, uh, Essex, that's it. Uh, for example, uh, for example, McClintock insists that the term post-colonialism is prematurely celebratory and obfuscatory, for example, in its being unstable with respect to women, end quote. But more than confusion and battles over the label, a good deal of the dispute over, a, there's a good deal of dispute over a wide range of issues and concerns, such as the role of the subaltern, the role of the psychological, the role of gender, the role of class, et cetera. So Nandy would criticize Fanon for an intellectual influence too much by Jean-Paul Sartre. And James Hiddleston in her overview of, uh, of post-colonial studies tells us about several post-colonial writers who criticize another, let's say predecessor only to be actually closer to their targets than they may themselves admit. For the most part, 12 scholars draw from post-colonial theorists without and now I'm going back to 12, without examining the tensions among them. For the most part, 12 scholars draw uh, from post-colonial theorists uh, without that examination. Foucault's on one page and Said on another, and the disputes are basically invisible. More importantly, I wanted to talk about post-colonial thought as being used for discourse analysis within 12 scholarship, that is identifying colonial structures embedded into or inscribed in international law. However, there's a lot of discussion about both the intentional and the discourse-driven structure in Twale writing. You know, the um, discourse or, or grammar in uh, the hegemonic, and yet there is little focus on when you're talking about intentional and when you're talking about discourse driven, what is the, you know, what's the relationship and how does one move from one to the other? Not that the post-colonial scholars were always at all that um, clear on that, but I think that's something that our, the 12 scholars can, can focus on. Just regarding the hegemonial, there's little discussion about the difference between the role of intention and the less conscious role of discourse in, making, in the making of international law. With Prabhakar here, uh, I can bring up your discourse analysis, but I also want to bring up the fact that you talk about the UN Security Council, five permanent members. Uh, and it's hard to say that wasn't adopted fully consciously, that you, don't, you didn't need uh, uh, a grammar behind it, but maybe you can talk about that, about the relationship between the two. So now I wanted to talk about 12.1, go to some of the scholars I've talked about. 
And I'd like to, uh, so I'd like here to put the, the easy generational designation aside for a bit. First, I'd like to turn the clock back and take a lead that Chimney placed in a footnote in his article, International Law Scholarship, Postcolonial India, Coping with Dualism. It's a fantastic article. Everyone should read it. To Pramanath Vadya Padhaye's International Law and Custom in Ancient India of 1920, and S. V. Viswanatha's uh, International Law in Ancient India of 1925. Both described in, in uh, the importance of developments of, inter of international law in ancient India, but both set their work in the post-war, post-World War I context about the failure of international law in the West for the f conflagration of World War I itself. So they're saying, hey, what did you do? And here, let's go to, uh, let's go to ancient India. So Vanda Yopadye uh, spoke of, quote, the cynical disregard of rights as having been evidenced during the last great war, end quote. And Viswanatha's study, quote, was suggested, to, he says, this was suggested to me by the great war of 1914, end quote. In light of the war, they underscored that the laws of war of ancient India should be looked upon. They are writing an indictment. And so they want to talk about both the uh, India as an example and you know, advocating for, for this Indian past again. So it's an indictment about, uh, about the current uh, turn of affairs in the metropole international law but also, hey, let's look. So this is not 1920s, early 20s, 1920, 1925. So I'd like to turn now to uh, talking about a number of scholars um, uh, and review the Chilean international lawyer, Alejandro Alvarez, the Nigerian international lawyer, Tazlam Oluwali uh, Elias, the Indian, Indian international C. Joseph Chaco and Nagendra Singh, and the uh, Algerian international lawyer, Mohammed Bajawi. Twelve one writers are all seen as representing the weak position, a la Gatti. Uh, and we do have to recognize most of them were institutionalists. Alvarez, Elias, Singh, and Bajawi were all judges on the ICJ, Elias and Singh presidents, and each held significant government posts. Elias was so deeply involved in the development of African regional institutions especially the Organization of African Unity, that I entitled a section of my article on Elias, Pan-Africanism and the Pan Am Flight Bag. Let's understand that these are insiders giving Hague lectures, publishing in the key journals of the Metropole uh, and involved in international institutions at a very, very high level. So it's worth contextualizing what Gotti has identified as representing the weak tradition. Remember, I will talk about Sometimes they're really talking about their own government's position. So when we talk about um, Elias, for example, you know, it's no no surprise that he's taking you know the Nigerian government position. You know, for example, on Biafra. Okay, so uh, we we have to read that. So where are they coming from? Why, et cetera? What are the you know what's the background context, et cetera? So let me start with Alejandro Alvarez. Significantly, the Leiden Journal of International Law decided to launch its periphery series in 2006 with, uh, with Alejandro Alvarez. It's important, however, to view Alvarez through the prism of Liliana Obregón's Criollo Consciousness, which is to see Alvarez's cultural perspective of Latin, uh, to see Alvarez's cultural perspective within the Latin American Americans of Spanish descent. So that's what her uh, SJD uh, thesis at Harvard was about. And it's, it's fantastic. And as I've pointed out, Alvarez's writing has to be viewed with an understanding of his explicit racial bias. In his most famous work, Le Droit International Americain in 1910, where he compared the relative success of the various Southern states of the Western hemisphere with the political stability of Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and Uruguay at the end of one spectrum by comparison with the island countries of Haiti and Dominican, which he characterized by their more tropical conditions and their small proportion 
of purely, of purely white race. Par la faible proportion de sa race blanche pure. Not entirely an isolated sentence in his writing. It's not like a one-off. And it's important to notice that and see it as it comes up and understand that's very much a crucial thing to keep in mind when one references Alvarez's American international law, by which he means the international law of the Western hemisphere, including the ongoing uh, imprint of the Mondro doctrine, but mainly of Latin America. If, if we turn to what Alvarez brought to Twale, Alvarez established a regional international law that was sui generis, that contributed key principles to international law writ large. In fact, he provided a list of 10 principles with sub-principles, and he goes from book to book with the sub-principles getting longer and longer. Um, again, primarily about Latin America, how, they, uh, how Latin America contributed to international law, including those adopted uh, by Latin America, like uh, adopted by Latin America by a conference in 1848, then to be adopted by the European powers in the Treaty of Paris uh, eight years later. Essentially, he perceives Latin America from the perspective of various freedoms, including that of the sea, commerce, of a commitment to republicanism, and the right not to become objects of European intervention. He writes, in the intellectual vocabulary of French sociological international law, and he is not shy about talking about civilized states. He insists that terra nullius does not apply to the Western hemisphere, but he leaves open, does it apply elsewhere? Elias. Elias was, as I have described him, was the insider's insider. In his book on the Vienna Convention of Treaties, he tells us that about his personal role in the conventions reaching a compromise between the West and the rest, the North and the South, basically acting as the reconciler by um, uh, reconciler to save the co convention. In, in the sphere of African inter organization, Elias acted as one of the leading figures of the moderate group of nations. Remember, I see him as seeing, uh, the question is, is it Elias or is it his nation? Remember, as opposed to the Casablanca group that had insisted upon the participation of the Algerian FLN. Elias, who was in addition to his roles as repartor uh, or chairman of various uh, congresses, and organizations held Nigerian posts, such as the federal attorney general, as federal attorney general and minister of justice of Nigeria. And of course, there are the various academic positions that he had, including uh, being one of the governors of SOAS, the School of Afri Oriental and African Studies in London. And he was the first dean of the Faculty of Law for the University of Lagos. Like other scholars identified with 12, one, Elias made a case for an early role for international law in sub-Saharan Africa, with a chapter on the contribution of Africa to international law about the medieval African kingdoms, such as Tim Timbuktu and Sangai. Elias does not really make a case for that Alvarez or some other Indian international lawyers did about the significant leadership role or the superiority of their local international law. Elias's story is really a story of the early beginnings and involvement on an international plane. We were there too, is really basically uh, the argument. Elias, I think, is most interesting in his discussion of Nigerian customary law, that's local customary law, which he compares with English common law, for example, in its growth and flexibility. And of course, he's, a, he's criticizing attempts to see it as just static. And that you know the idea of you know the the static nation of of African culture and society and law, um, and so he also compares it against the customary law across the British dependencies, uh, which is the central theme of his book, British Colonial Law: A Comparative Study of the Interaction Between English and Local Laws in British Dependencies. Nevertheless, he does want to describe Africa law as sui generis, as well as defend it against Africans who would look down upon it. So he says, and this is a book in, in, uh, from a book in the 1950s, uh, 
quote, it is curious that those who now proudly don their traditional costumes in and outside Nigeria as an outward expression of the renaissance of their feelings should make so light of this bedrock of their culture and be so anxious to get rid of their traditional laws, which are neither barbarous nor unsuitable in their context, end quote. And he talks about English trained Nigerian lawyers as having, quote, what the psychologists call an inferiority complex, end quote. So whether that's uh, an aside or whether you can read Fanon into uh, Elias, so he's talking about the inferiority complex and he resists the objectification of African life. African life should be taken seriously and no longer, and this is an early, in an early work, no longer regarded as a museum object to delight European fancies, end quote. Like many writers assigned to 12.1, Elias wrote about general assembly resolutions and the International Law Commission as becoming sources of new law. The recommendations of Article 18.2 of the UN Charter represented more than mere recommendations as the model of international law is moving from consent to consensus in his words. There is uh, the Elias described by Matt Craven as stuck in the middle between those on the two sides of the succession dispute with Elias wanting true to his general call to increased application of the social sciences, additional study. There's no avoiding the fact that Elias was an inveterate social scientist and an institutional mainstay. And yet there's a general sense of optimism based on the sheer numbers of new states. This is when we come into the 1960s, driving changes in the framing of international law that should be entirely, that should not be entirely downplayed. Chimney, in fact, hits a sympathetic note in his Coping with Dualism article when he talks about a period of optimism in the 1960s and 70s, although he also depicts it as, as basically a mirage. I have repeatedly described Elias as the insider, the moderating force in conflict with the more radical forces in Africa. And yes, from a 12-2 perspective, he is working for change from within the machinery of international law because he feels, and this is understandable, that it could work. Joseph Chaco, so I'm now turning to India. I want to turn to India, but before discussing Nagendra Singh, I would like to discuss C. Joseph Chaco, who gave Hague lectures in 1958 on India's contribution to the field of international law concepts. So here's 1958, before uh, Alexander visits books uh, at The Hague. Chaco at the time was a university professor of political science at Delhi University, and among numerous other, and among new, numerous other positions was on the board of governors of the Indian School of International Studies, which shortly become the first editor of the Indian Journal of International Law with its first issue, and it turns out that Chaco's lectures, however, I think, so it's remember India's contribution to the field of international law. It turns out the title of his lectures was a bit misleading. There were only 20, the first 22 pages given over to India's international legal, the background of international law in India. In those pages, he goes through the narrative of ancient Indian international law. This is before the publications, uh, publication of, as I mentioned, of Singh's international India and International Law and Alexander's book on in international law in India and further India, as well as Alexander Alexandrovich's uh, sorry, preparatory Hague lectures, but not before Benji Hopaye and Viswanatha's books from the 1920s, nor the stream of articles in the Indian Yearbook of International Affairs edited by Alexandrovich. So Alexander Alexandrovich's group was already well underway. Nevertheless, he goes through what was becoming a familiar story of the interstate rules of Desi Dharma, drawing from the Sritis and the Dharma Sutras, but especially from Katilya's Arthasastra, and covered topics like diplomatic privileges and treaties and the rights of states in ancient India. We even finding him uttering sentences like, they were not Wilsonians in those days, with a footnote to Philip Jessup's uh, traditional diplomacy and parliamentary uh, diplomacy. He does offer that, quote, in fact, it is not altogether incorrect to observe here that the principal 
the principle of Pacta Sunt Servanda so frequently dealt with in modern considerations of treaties may well be traced to India, chiefly Catilia. But this is little more than a conjectural aside. And for the most part, Chaco is taking 22 pages to setting out early parallels to, current, to the current state of mainstream international law. And he offers on the last page of that section, in the revolution of the various processes of this regulation, ancient India has played her part, end quote. The rest of Chaco's lectures, that would say the bulk of them, uh, covered municipal court decisions on questions of jurisdiction, state succession, and sovereign immunity. As it turns out, Chaco's rehearsal of various court decisions is rather self-serving, for example, establishing that the paramountcy of the British crown over the princely states meant that the instruments of accession signed by the states were real, really superfluous and, the sovereign, and sovereignty over the states transferred naturally and automatically. So uh, I, I don't know, uh, Prabhakar, whether you've seen that yet, but uh, it's interesting to see him sit, talking about that in The Hague. Kashmir, however, evidences a special case in which for the ruler of Jammu and Kashmir, the lapse of British parliament uh, paramountcy served as an unavoidable and immediate reversion to his, that is the ruler's full sovereignty, devoid of all legal and political trammels, end quote. So in the case of Kashmir, the instrument of accession actually mattered. It actually mattered as it didn't for the rest of the, uh, for the uh, uh, Indian princely states. As I mentioned, the various case studies and the decision of Kashmir were politically self-serving and finally have little to do with India's contribution to international law writ large. Although if someone you know, goes deeper into them, one might uh, try and understand what he, what he was doing in terms of India uh, international law writ large. Nagendra Singh, just like we learned from the otherwise reticent Elias that he drove the compromise solution for the uh, Vienna Convention on Treaties, we learned from Nagendra Singh that having joined the India Civil Service in 1937, he was barred from participation in the India Constituent Assembly. But it was recognized by Benegal Rao and S.V. Patel that Singh, a member of the royal family of Dangapur in Rajasthan, would be, quote, bringing into, and this is a uh, uh, quote from, from Singh, bringing into the Constituent Assembly a number of Indian states that that at the time when at the time when princely india was somewhat hesitant to join that body end quote so as a solution a solution was quickly found uh which meant his merely resigning his position with the civil service singh may be on the other side from chaco on the role of the princely states but he was also very much the institutionalist with high government positions including joint secretary uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, 1946 through 56, Director G General of Shipping, 1954 through 64, and Special Secretary to the President, 1966 through 72. In his India and International Law, the title page itself goes down half a page long with his various degrees, including law degrees from Cambridge and his important international positions, such as being a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, Vice Chairman of UNCTRAL, and vice president of the International Law Commission. At the time of the publication of India and International Law, Singh held various governmental and international positions. And his book bears the imprimatur of the Indian government with a forward by G.K. Patak, uh, the vice president of India. Most of his slim book, sets out various ways in which interstatal law in India represents antecedents of international law as it developed in the West. He wanted to establish parallels. So his chapters on uh, Lex as Rex and Pacta Sunt Servanda and various other headings in the book are familiar to the international lawyer in general. For Nagendra Singh, the law of nations has ancient roots so that each of the principles he parallels, although they are not always parallel, he finds in epic texts, the law of Manu or other texts identifying early Indian principles. And his book is full of Sanskrit citations. 
He explained that, quote, in India, the existence of the broad prerequisites for the growth of interstate law could be traced as far back as the Vedic age, 4,000 BC to 1,000 BC, when as revealed by the Vedic literature, there were separate tribes in existence which had their own government organ in the shape of the Rajan or king. And there were plenty of opportunities of regular intercourse between them, end quote. And when he talks about emissaries, he observes that, quote, the, the dutas of interstate relations goes back to Ramayana and Mahabharata. Katilya's Arthasastra is for saying a key text for him. But Katilya does not for him represent, as it would for Alexandrovich, the touchstone of a mindset. Rather, Singh asserts that even to accept Arathastra as a textbook of law is to do the greatest injustice to the concept of law in ancient India, end quote. So he turns to Katilya over and over again as a source of good evidence. The main point in Singh's book is the early expanse of the law of nations in India. He finds that India, he finds that India primarily in Hindu texts, but I see Singh is closer to the palimpsest vision of India of Nehru. In Singh's Theory of Force, published in 1969, the same year as India and International Law, he wrote, quote, the concept of defense furnishes the fundamental basis of the state, whether ancient or medieval or modern, and a study of its revolution in the history of India and the various cha changes it underwent, both in theory and political organization of the state from the days of the imperial Mor uh, Mauryas and Guptas to the Rajputs and Konaj and uh, of Kunaj and Delhi, and from the advent of the Islamic rule with, the sultan with its sultanic to the efflorence, efflorence of, Mughal, of the Mughal Empire, consists a subject of paramount importance for the true assessment of the genius of the nation, its culture and its civilization, end quote. Despite all the layers, we are talking about the same civilization. For the key contribution to international law, Singh wants to highlight at the end of his book, the eradication of war and the promotion of peace. And he will re rehearse attention given to Ashoka. Uh, and then he turns to modern times after India's independence, specifically with India's adoption of the principles of Panchil or peaceful coexistence clearly articulated in the treaty between India and China in 1924, never mind the clash, the border clashes with India, not mentioned in his book, I mean, between India and China after, after uh, 1954. The concluding pages of India and international law are given over to a Nehru Nehruvian view of international law sourced in the Indian past. So he quotes Nehru's speech on the floor of the Lok Sabha, Sabha in 1955. Singh is a Nehruvian, who is also our, who is not articulating a critique of international law, but framing the early Indian adoption of international law rules and articulating India's leadership role in the move to peaceful coexistence in international order. Now I'd like to turn briefly to Bajawi. Bajawi here is quite, uh, uh, Benjamin, uh, Mohammed uh, Bajawi, the international uh, revolutionary lawyer is known among other things for his key role in pressing for the new international economic order, including writing the UNESCO publication on the NEIO. But Jowie there is quite clear in his critique of the neocolonial world. Imperialism, he asserts, despite the sta staggering blows it has received, still shows an extraordinary ability to co-opt and amazing powers of adjustment, end quote. His first chapter is labeled Predatory Economy and the International Law of Indifference, and his prose is biting. In his chapter on Bajawi, Umut Ozu focuses on Bajawi's law and the Algerian Revolution in 1961, and then on his arguments that he wrote on behalf of uh, Algeria for the ICJ's uh, advisory uh, opinion uh, on uh, Western Sahara in 1975. Osher's argument in his chapter is that, quote, Bajawi's views on self-determination in 1961 and 1975 are indicative 
of a certain refinement of his thinking in the sense not not of making a rupture or radical departure especially since Bajawi was always committed to reforming international law and this is interesting from within the discipline centers of intellectual and professional power and here Oju places a footnote to the NIEO but of demonstrating an expansion and argumentation of his existing beliefs into broader account of the historical and conceptual relations between colonialism and international law, end quote. It is worth noting that Oju talked of a radical critique, oddly only in a footnote, stating that his concern in the article has to do with Bajawi's struggle to develop a radical critique of classical international law as part of a broader attempt to realize a fully non-European international legal order, end quote. I thought it particularly worth referencing Bajawi here to put a little bit of the generational context aside, you know, because he's at the same time as some of the other authors I've spoken about. In his article on Elias for the Leiden Journal of International Law, James Gotti identified Elias as very much in the weak tradition and in the context of the NIEO, he wrote, the Elias tradition support of the new international economic order had much in common with the alter alternative school, although Elias's reformist agenda did not accommodate the outright rejection of rules of international economic law that were inimicable uh, to the interests of newly independent states of Africa and Asia. By comparison, Gadi asserts that, quote, Mohammed Bajawi's towards a new international economic order is perhaps most well the most well-known text that best exemplifies both the case for a rejection of the international legal order and also the optimism of reformism in this alternative tradition, particularly in the climate of the 1970s and 80s, end quote. Nevertheless, the optimism attributed to both Elias and Bajawi might both be seen under the period of optimism as a false hope of chimneys coping with dualism, where he provides a heading, the imagined United Nations, perhaps playing on Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, conveying unreality. At the same time, it's noteworthy that in his Grotius lecture, Gotti provides a list of writers that include Alvarez and Elias, Abisab and Bajawi, Chimney and Boxy, which is to say, a range of scholars from the periphery, whether designated now as 12-1 or 12-2, weak or strong, and asserts, quote, what is striking about this group of third world scholars is that they never sought to fit conventional tropes of the discipline. These international lawyers spread throughout the third world in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and beyond engaged in what Basuki Nasia has described as rebel imagination in plural ways in which the promise of international law could be reimagined, end quote. It is interesting to see Gatti drawing them together. I would say, however, that each of these figures has to be looked at in individual terms, in terms of their context and their particular energy, the particular energy behind their critiques and visions of progress. We have to remember Alvarez's undeniable racist views more than Ob Obregon's uh, Creo Criollo consciousness and his intellectual framing within French sociological jurisprudence when we want to talk about his championing the place of Latin America and talking about US hegemony. We have to think about Elias's working very much as the consummate insider and his advocacy for his government's position. And I mentioned the, the comment on Biafra, um, often quite moderate, while pressing for an African and a new state agenda. There are, I think, no simple binaries. With regard to the current 12, our current 12 colleagues, I have identified an important deployment of discourse studies to understand the very structure and grammar of international law. But just as it is important to contextualize the earlier third world legal scholars working through the various elements of their culture, their education, and their craft, and think of their individual contributions, so too 12 scholars of the present can draw deeply from the wells of post-colonial discourse as they have done, 
uh, this course study while also advocating strategies of change, but in both their description and prescription, an attempt to grapple with the interwoven roles of discourse structure and intent agency may be worth uh, working through with more focus. And so that's, uh, that's the talk. So, uh, so uh, Prabhakar. Thank you, Carl, for the fascinating lecture. I'm sure we've all um, uh, uh, learned so much from it. Um, uh, this is more or less a twill crowd, I, 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 I could suggest. Uh, and we are aware of some of the uh, uh, authors you spoke about. We've been reading them for the last decade. Um, but what I think uh, was really a contribution uh, to this discourse is to not see um, all these great uh, revolutionary or critical thinkers uh, as, as one, one, one monolith. That is not the case. They, as you said, come from different uh, uh, parts of the world and they bring different energies to use your word. And this uh, individual focus on these scholars starting from Alvarez in Latin America to uh, Elias in Nigeria and Chako and Nagento Singh in India uh, what we see, uh, as you said, is that uh, they are uh, so they stand uh, at different positions, uh, even when critiquing uh, our Western inheritance of the law in general and international in particular. As you said, Elias uh, was an insider's insider, a very uh, useful uh, phrase with which to understand him, an institutionalist. And a lot of these people who uh, were, who were either in the system as judges of international law or those who could not become judges, such as um, uh, R.P. Anand, they were all, in a way, uh, hopeful of international law. Uh, they were critical in their own way, and Twill 2 thinks that Twill 1 was not critical enough. It is always the case, I think, when the next generation looks at the older generation, um, the older generation uh, comes across as institutionalist or um, uh, or the establishment, uh, less critical than they should be. Um, and that is always the critique uh, uh, of, of, of um, Indian uh, lawyers who are more in practice, or interna Indian international lawyers who are more in practice than in, in theory. And they think that this questioning of not being critical enough is, is problematic if you don't practice international law. And you cannot disagree because if you practice international law, the criticality is very different. We're critical, but within the system attacking from the belly of the beast um, uh, as compared to you know, full-time academic uh, sort of uh, conversation that you generate uh, where you're receiving um, the texts of international law either from general assembly resolutions, security council resolutions, international law commission drafts, reports, writings of the public. It's our deception is surely, surely different based on uh, where we are epistemologically located. So thank you very much uh, for this. I hope that uh, I, I've had the privilege of reading the uh, first basic draft of roughly 6,000 words. And um, I hope that uh, this is start of a fantastic article that will, uh, that will uh, you know, uh, grow fully in, in, in the months to come. Uh, and, and we'll be able to sort of read it uh, for the insight you have presented today, um, perhaps with more details and, uh, and other things related uh, with publication and sort of turning a talk into an article. Thank you very much for this. Um, we have uh, our center's director, co-director, Professor Gudmunder Eriksen, who is also a judge uh, and a professor. So uh, one of the insiders uh, inside of the system, uh, but we also have others, uh, uh, teachers and PhD students. Uh, so we are open to questions. Uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can introduce yourself and ask questions. And before that, uh, if, there's, uh, if someone wants to um, uh, make a comment, general comment, then you're open to, uh, to that. It's Professor Goodmunder. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Carl, and I may call you Carl. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. So, it's, of course, very interesting. My colleagues in the, in the, in the center know how I kind of think about these things and I said I say think because I don't have any conclusions yet but I, I was just counting the years uh, since I, I first encountered uh, third world international lawmakers so it's 47 years now 
in the context of the Law of the Sea Convention. <clears throat> now, Bajawi was a peripheral member there. Uh, and I, I was very, well, it's very interesting to see you talk about the, the, uh, the insiders. That applies both to Nagendra and to Elias. They were insiders in that sense. They were not in, in, per se scholars. <clears throat> and that's certainly true also of, of, of President Bajawi. But these were people who were actually in the field making international law. And what I was hoping to hear more from you uh, was uh, what was inter inter introduced in the in the um, the uh, uh, presentation of, of your lecture about about the Latin American contribution to to international law. Because I've always been saying that you know international law began 200 years ago there in a post-colonial period of, of the Latin America. I think this year is the 200th anniversary of a lot of. Uh, uh, countries in the South America, South America, including all the way up to the <clears throat> the elaboration of the Charter and, and and beyond, and then particularly in the Law of the Sea context, the the stalwarts were from that part of the world. So I I I can at least attribute um, I, I call the Law of the Sea uh, a system a, a third world uh, system in many ways. But this is all um, all very interesting because I I came to be puzzled about this. I was very clear. Uh, up to many years ago, but um, but this uh, when when I hear what James Gottlieb is saying, the psychological aspects. I think of myself. <clears throat> am I really thinking? Am I influenced by so much by my by my my training and by looking at those people in the same way? Are they influenced by the training they get from uh, from Western scholars? Many of them, as you mentioned, <clears throat> are, are study in Cambridge now. Um, I just read a recent art an article, which would be published in the American Journal, 52 pages, about an, a process that I'm involved in now, the, uh, in UNCITRA, uh, trying to establish a new a multilateral convention there. And I felt like if ants could think how an ant must feel when someone is looking at the activities of an ant. <clears throat> and is, am I really thinking this when I'm, when I'm actually sitting down talking to people about how to reach a solution, which we're all agreed on, has to be found. So this, this then there, all the spe sp speaking of the scholars kind of disrupts me from that thinking. But that's my general thoughts, and I mean I, I plan to continue thinking along these lines, trying to understand what exactly I am thinking when I'm sitting down trying to establish international law. Are your comments, response to uh, good news? Yes, yeah. So, so thanks a lot. Uh, so, Arnold Be uh, Lorca Becker uh, has uh, spoken, uh, has written about, and so, so is Liliana Obregon about. Uh, you should look at her work about uh, Latin American writers. I'd like to, see, you know, they were very important in terms of uh, the Calvo doctrine and uh, Drago and Calvo and. Uh, but what's interesting in terms of to go back to Alvarez himself, who is very important and tied in. There's a there's a new book on um, the uh, the American the uh, American organizations and uh, you know his relationship with um, uh, with American uh, U.S. Inter uh, international uh, lawyers and the interaction with with uh, the U.S. So that's a, there's a very interesting new book on that. But um, in terms of the intellectual background and and the educational background, to take the example of of Al Al Alvarez, he was trained by he and he lived mainly in Paris. So he was the Chilean ambassador to, to France. And he, li and he wrote that first book in French. And of course, for Latin America, France quickly becomes in the 19th century, the metropole. So everyone in uh, Latin American scholarship is writing in French. And, but it's uh, the cultural center as well. The cultural metropole is Paris. But he trains with the, um, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the center figures of French uh, sociological international legal scholarship. He, his first, uh, you know, his, his uh, book, uh, Le Droit International, uh, International Americain is published by their publisher, the same, publica uh, the same publisher that published uh, their review and which became the main uh, French review of international law. Uh, he's very much 
writing in their idiom. There's no question about that. And he, he's trained, uh, he, he's trained basically as a French sociological international lawyer. Elias is interesting as well because he is going back and forth uh, to, uh, to the UK. And as I said, he was one of the governors of the School of uh, uh, Oriental and African Studies in, in London. That's being an insider, it's the insider in the uh, metropolitan uh, educational institutions. So it's, uh, you know, so that, you know, there, the, that's very much part, and he is very much a, um, uh, he's a, a very strong adopter of the social sciences. And so he looks a great deal to um, anthropology as very helpful in his analysis. And he wants more anthropology in the analysis of customary Nigerian law. Uh, so th that's very much who he is and very much built into his framework. So I think that's, that's an important piece to see. Uh, it's not just that somebody has gone off and, and, and was trained by, um, trained by one of the Yale school uh, thinkers or trained, by, trained in Cambridge. The, these, are, these are so embedded and so part of their interactions uh, and the way they think and also who they talk to. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't have uh, Alvarez writing differently uh, when he writes in the American Journal of International Law about the US and he writes elsewhere. So they pick their, they pick their audience as well. Uh, so when they write to their audiences, it may be they take different... Uh, there's, there's a different framing. It's, it, it, it sounds slightly differently, even though they're making similar points. So I thought that would be useful. Thank you. By the way, Alvarez, you speak of as he's not necessarily an outlier as far as uh, his, um, the, ex the expressions that, that you mentioned about him, the quotations, uh, even today, there is a certain yeah. fascination. I've, I've been living in, in South America, well, Central America for 20 years now. And there is a certain fascination for non, shall we say, Latin American uh, concepts. Who, was the, who, who are the Castilians and, uh, and who are the uh, direct descendants of the Spaniards and so forth as opposed to others. So it's not exactly, it's not, it's not, it's not left. No, 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 no. And in fact, uh, yeah, well, that's interesting that it hasn't, it hasn't, it, it hasn't departed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so Liliana uh, Obregon has worked on several thinkers like Bello and uh, I think Calvo which sure. in her SVD, uh, Thesis and, and fantastic. Um, Meghna, you have a question? No, you, are, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself, Meghna. Yes. You have... Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Now, yes. Sorry. Sorry, my name's Meghna. Um, I'm a legal academic, and I just had a follow up question to both you professors and also you Professor Prabhakar saying, actually, um, just talking about this dichotomy, we're spending so much time on genealogy. I presented a paper at SOAS, actually at the post-colonial uh, colloquium for internet, uh, critical legal studies. And my big argument is that us twill scholars trying to focus so much on dividing like looking at genealogy in such a specific way and trying to divide 121 into 122 and getting into the semantics of or the nomenclature or however you'd like to put it of subterranean. Does that differentiate from 121? Does that differentiate from post-colonial? Mm -hmm. To me, 122 is a very specific school of thought and I point out, like, I'd be really grateful, actually, if I could send my paper to all you guys, whoever's in this, this forum right now and get some comments on it. Because I argue that just wasting our time on this whole semantics issue creates a problem because at the end of the day, they were different. It's exactly as you were saying, Professor Carl, today, like, you know, it's 
everything's based on context, isn't it? Like at the end of the day, all these arguments by these scholars, they were all different people. Some of them were jurists, some of them were academicians, some of them were professors, whatever they were in their lives, a lot of it came. And also they were from different countries. And we have to be honest, this was the time where, you know, colonialization was just about like becoming a thing, so to speak, you know, like the countries were just becoming independent, new international economic order, as you pointed out, had just, and Badawi's given credit for that, although there were a lot of scholars involved with that. I'm sorry, I would argue that as well. But I'd be grateful to hear your opinions about the significance of this dichotomy and why we should actually stick to these terms. Sorry. <laughs> I went on. So to some degree, I was doing exactly what you were saying, which is to say this the 12 one 12 two should be, you know, there should, you know, one should take a critical focus on, on separating 12 one because there are, you know, it's first of all, it's not necessarily generational and one learns, of course, and then one is in different contexts. And so I do say that I do think that, you know, to be optimistic about possibilities in the UN is not crazy. I mean, and you have Richard Falk writing uh, alongside and agreeing with people, you know, back in the 60s writing, you, you know, it's, I don't think it's crazy. Um, maybe, maybe it is, but is it, is it really totally a false hope and a mirage? Maybe, maybe we can see that now as, you know, and it not turning out, turning out that way, but Considering the amount of movement, and I remember I grew up in the New York, New York suburbs uh, in the 1960s, and I remember going and seeing the UN with all the flags, yeah. you know, in the 1960s, and it's exciting. It was exciting to see all those flags, and so, you know, of course, one, you know, might have to draw, look behind it, and see everything that's happening. But the excitement is not, you know, I think is not crazy uh, that you know. You are now, and, and so there's a lot of critique, you know, in post-colonial studies about the focus on nationalism itself and the over-focus on nationalism, uh, because, you know, these are the UN, you know, you get recognized, et cetera. And we can go that, you know, for another, you know, uh, three hours on that. But, 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 but the excitement is not crazy, I think, you know, and the optimism is not that crazy. So you have to rethink, I, I do think when you, and you have scholars uh, in 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 the in the West as well, talking to scholars, uh, you know, in the South about exactly that, ex exactly you know, hey, this is a, a new mode of international law driven by consensus rather than, I mean, uh, driven by consensus rather than the consent. consent. Point that and, you make, and, and you know, that's you know, is it crazy? Do, is you it know, crazy? Uh, yeah, is it, is it simply a, you know, imagined UN? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I think Chimney under, understands that optimism, but he does say, you know, imagined UN. So I, I think agree. that's a great, that's a great article. If, I if, agree. I, I think Chimney is the reason why he bridges the divide between 12.1 and 12.2 in so many different ways. It tends to confuse, and methodologically, when you're writing a PhD, it tends to confuse you a little bit in terms of when you're reading to me, you have to be really careful. I'd be really, really interested to get your perspectives on that if you don't mind me sending you my paper. Sure, sure, absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, do we have other questions? Questions from uh, other participants? Um, uh, um. Okay, so uh, we have uh, one from Zara Lee. I'm sorry that I'm not able to turn to the, turn on the camera and microphone right now. Thank you, Professor Landor, for the informative and inspiring lecture. I'm a PhD student from China, currently working on a critique of the concept of historical historic title well, of the sea um, in the law of the territorial acquisition for me. For me, the quest for territorial sovereignty for third world states the struggle then to locate themselves in trying to tame or transform the symbolic order turned out not successful. And even some of the states became complicit, uh, complicitly themselves under the neoliberal uh, colonial settings. Maybe another step further 
should be taken to understand international law in a not so international way, which is framed in a presupposed center in order to be centered. If, only, if one is only feeling upset with the present center and trying to recenter, the dichotomy of center periphery may not change and structural contradictions may reemerge over and over again. So that is the question from uh, Zhao Ranlin, who is actually a PhD student from China. Yeah. So first of all, uh, the reference to um, uh, sovereign territory, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're coming coming out of a uh, out of a decolonization process, how could that be less of a focus? And yet, who you know, who what exactly does it mean? Why are you setting up structures that that are still uh, based on the nation state. And so there's a lot of uh, discussion about, uh, about that. Um, Nigeria itself is a federal system, you know, has a federal system and it has to split and split and split and split because of the divides between it. And so there, there are questions about, uh, you know, how much the, you know, the, there are a lot of debates at the time and now as well, and within post-colonial studies as well about exactly how one should look at the nation state and that, you know, and how one should look at, um, and then of course, in terms of uh, territorial sovereignty, there are obviously, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the PhD student from China is, you know, mentions the law of the sea and there's all, all obviously immense fights over, you know, who owns what, who, who et cetera, uh, in which the stakes are very high and all of the, the, the tools of 12.1 and 12.2 uh, are, uh, are essential in using, in looking at, at those as well. Um, and, but there's, again, there's this whole range of fights, let's say just in, in post-colonialism about what does one think about the nation state? And, you know, uh, and um, there are a lot of discussions about, you know, did, did, was there too much invested in it? And, why and so that can be even looked at further about why um so and and my, I, i've written elsewhere you know outside of this context about um i have a an article called regionalism geography and international legal imagination in which i basically say hey the whole notion of nation state is very short-lived you know one thinks of uh you know i mean there are a lot of people who say okay uh, 1648, Westphalia didn't really happen in 1648. But, you know, even if one looks at the very epicenter, one looks at France, for example, there's a book, uh, the wonderful historian, Eugen uh, Weber, who has a book, Peasants and the Frenchmen, who said it took till 1914 for the French to really re recognize that they were French. You know, you go through the French peasantry. And, you know, even in France, which you think of as, so, and then if you look at uh, international legal scholarship, are they even the positivists as po purely positivist as people see them as? You know, are, there's all sorts of, of sovereignty splitting and di dicing and slicing. And so this notion of the nation state, I think, is something that uh, has been very short lived. So I wrote this when people were thinking about globalization as ending the nation state. So I said, hey, wait a minute, you know, how strong was it? How lo short, how long is it? I mean, is it really that, you know, and yet it has such importance in international legal thinking. But the question is, I, I was saying, hey, it, it had, it, there, there are lots of holes in it. It hasn't, you know, it's, the, it's very porous. There's always been co complexities to it. And it's, it's a very short lived, uh, you know, it, it's seen as having had much more longevity than it actually has. So uh, that's what I was, uh, so I, I thought th that might be useful. Thank you, Carl, for the explanation. Um, clearly, uh, the amount of food for thought Carl has served uh, 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 is, is, is uh, far too much to be consumed in an hour. Uh, uh, this was Carl's keynote, and then we're happy uh, that uh, we had good participation and good questions uh, in response to Carl's presentation. And I hope all our participants will see this as only a start of conversation that has been ongoing. Conversation we started um, last year and it is ongoing.
Um, okay, so, can, I make uh, a, can I interject a comment? Because I, to Carl, yeah. I would say <clears throat> even 50 years after I first came to the UN, every year since I'm still enthused by every time I come up to those flags on, on First Avenue. So, I'm so still excited as, as, about the prospects. So as Professor Dixon uh, says, the, 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 the optimism continues, it should. Uh, we uh, view law generally and international law, square, particularly from, uh, from our own epistemological locations. Um, I think what is important is, and as Carl has suggested, through his ideas of genealogy, is that we must, we must continue to argue um, uh, uh, we must continue to argue because, um, as we know, uh, in dialectics, the real finding is always in a flux. You say something, you respond, and then the conversation moves on. So there is no static finding to be stored away somewhere, but it's always in a state of flux, uh, in, uh, uh, the state of dialectics. And that is what we have seen today. Um, uh, uh, so um, thank you, Carl, very much uh, for this much anticipated keynote. And we have taken a lot from it, and uh, we hope that uh, that that uh, that we'll have more of this as time progresses. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, and see you uh, for the next talk. Thank you. Thank you.